you just follow your heart, so however it plays out, it plays out, but then in the end, you feel this connectedness, this feeling like nobody is leaving anybody. It's not, it's not a given fact of life that you have to leave, or that you have to separate in some way. It's beautiful. There's a part where Jesus teaches that, he says, you have many, many strange beliefs, but perhaps the strangest of all your beliefs is the belief that you can, you have to lose the ones that you love. And when you think about it, that in this world that seems to be a basic belief that you always, you only have a limited time with the ones you love, and that that time ends, and then you lose them in the end. And it really, when you think about it, it is pretty strange belief. If that's that's where we're feeling all our love and connection, the belief that it has to end, you know, is is a good one to to question. Mm. So it's like what we get when we go deeper into the spirituality and have the experiences, the continuity of life. But it's it's within our hearts. It's not a continuity that we find in time. And so it's it's good as we go along to just stop looking for it in time, you know, to, to stop trying to depend on time to bring us the continuity. Because it's like this world seems to be a world of, of beginnings and endings, of, of breaks, of departures. And, you know, if you really keep your faith in that, then it can, that's when it can get kind of disheartening, depressing, you know, sad, lonely, and so forth. If you keep your faith in the, in the world, in the images of the world, you can't help but come to that kind of feeling. But it's not the end. It's not, not the goal. And you can find that in the manual, Lord, about seven, page seven, something like that. There is no, there is no end to relationships. Yeah. It's impossible to have an end to a relationship. It will continue sooner or later. Yes. When you are ready for it. Yeah. It helped me one time when I was going through a, a, a breakup many years ago, and um, and I just read one sentence, and it was basically that that you will appear to separate. I mean, just that word appear. Mm. And then followed by the message that all relationships are maximal. That each one has, has taught and learned the most that they can in any relationship. And those are just, it's like healing, healing words coming through because I think the heartbreak and the sadness is always what could have been. Or uh, this idea that um, that I didn't complete, I didn't complete what I needed to complete, and this is saying no, it, it's maximal. Even when people appear to separate, the most that you could teach and learn, the closest you could come to forgiveness, you did with this experience, and and it's maximal. And of course, it continues on. Then you have other opportunities. <laughs> it's not like oh, it's over and that's it. <laughs> it's always like you have more opportunities. So. So even when people will say, oh, I, I didn't get to say goodbye to my father or my mother before they passed away, or I didn't really get to say what was on my heart, or express the love that I had for my parents or something before they passed away, the opportunities just keep coming and coming and coming. And also, there's an idea that somehow that communication is limited to the body, uh, as if like, oh, I blew my chance, you know. But their body's gone now, so I, I blew my chance. And it's like there's all kinds of research, everything from near-death experiences to out-of-body experiences to all around the world now. There's lots and lots of literature on people that seemingly are in are in comas, are brain dead, have no activity going on, and they seem to be completely out of it from what the world would say. And if communication was based on the body and on brain activity, and on uh, words and so forth, then it would seem like that is a break. A coma <laughs> is a definite break in communication. And yet, over and over, you'll hear stories of patients that come out of comas, and they'll say, why did you tell that story about me? And uh, during operations, they'll come back uh, after they come out of anesthesia and say to the doctor, you know, why, did you, why were you joking about this uh, during my operation? You know, so clearly the evidence is starting to flood in over and over that communication is not limited to the body. And the, a lot of the sadness and hurt and loss is based on the belief that it is limited to the body. 
I mean, it's one thing to feel somebody's touch or, or hug or caress. You know, that's, that's one form of communication. It's another form of communication to sit there and have a cup of tea and coffee and have just a very intimate talk. Talk about your deepest thoughts and feelings. And it seems like if that body is not there, then you can't do that. I always tell people, well, you might as well keep on talking to them because they're still there. <laughs> you just can't see them, <laughs> but they're still there. When they talk about communicating with the dead, it really is, it's really that you're communicating with yourself all the time. Everything you think and say and do is really teaching yourself and the whole universe. It's almost like having a, your own radio station and you're broadcasting and you're sending out these sounds and messages on the airwaves of, of who you believe you are. So if you believe you're limited, if you believe you're separate, if you believe you're, you're different, you're somehow isolated and closed off and everything, then you, your thoughts are broadcasting that belief to yourself and to the whole universe. And then, when you learn to change your tune and you start to replace those thoughts with loving thoughts, with thoughts of your true nature, then it's like you're broadcasting uh, with a new frequency. <laughs> you're, you've changed your channel, you know, to a higher channel a channel that's more approximate to the truth of who you are, and that is teaching you and everyone uh, who you who you are. So this is why now when they're coming up in quantum physics, they're saying that there really is no matter in matter, that basically all of time and space is just uh, energy, and it's vibrating either very slowly, we would say that what seems to be flesh or the earth or something that's very hard like wood just seems to be vibrating, energy vibrating at a very slow rate and then as you go higher and higher into the vibrations and into the ethers you start to approach more of a purified state of energy or light which is who we are. That's what we were created. We were created by a loving God uh, in the likeness and image of God, God certainly isn't a piece of wood or uh, a little slab of flesh or a rock. God is far beyond those tiny little manifestations. God is this beautiful, pure, abstract light of wisdom and love that just radiates forever and ever and ever in eternity. And who we are is an expression of that light. So when we forget who we are, we seem to identify with what we could call more dense vibrations of, of energy and the more we release these beliefs, these limiting beliefs and these thoughts we hold about ourselves, then we approach that much more abstract experience. We truly are an idea in the mind of God. You know, sometimes people say, I like the feeling that I'm a child of God, but, but I don't even know what that means. You know, are we all children of God? It's like, well, that's a nice metaphor, but God didn't create the body. Uh, God is perfection and what God creates is perfect. Uh, just like we get apples from apple trees in this world and bananas from banana trees and oranges from orange trees, you, you get the same fruit from the parent. And so if the parent is spirit, uh, the fruit of the parent is spirit. It's, it would be strange to have a creative parent that was pure spirit that started popping out these avocados, <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, where did these avocados come from? Where did these little slabs of flesh uh, come from? But except that they are the projection of the belief in separation. If we believe we could separate from that love and light, it's a crazy idea, but if we actually believe we could separate, and you could use the same dynamics of in heaven we just extend and radiate love forever and ever, but if you took a crazy idea that you were separate from God and you projected it, like a little dark speck, you projected it, then this world, these bodies are projections of separation. And it does even look like separation. I mean, you, have, you look out of your body's eyes and you look around the, the tent and you say, oh, look, little separate 
bodies all sitting around in chairs, you know. <laughs> it, it looks pretty convincing. It really looks like everybody is separate. They're kind of, they've got their own space, their own histories, their own goals and agendas, you know, their own personalities. They seem to be unique, their own uh, little fingerprints, each one on the hands, you know, it's, it's like if they were like little toys, it, they would look pretty convincing. Uh, as convincing for the idea of separation, <laughs> they're all so unique, you know, even the ones that look alike, the more you get to know them, hmm, no, <laughs> they are not the same. But this is why we need to forgive, because we are perceiving a realm of separation and we need to have a unified perception. We need to come to a different way of looking at the world like Jesus did when he was on the cross and could say things like, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's not the typical words you would expect from somebody who's just been strung up on a cross uh, and has blood coming from their arms and their legs. That's not what you would expect. But if he was in a state where he could see the unification, the unified field of everyone. Not the train there, right? <laughs> Jesus could see beyond the separation. He could see the uni unity. He could see the unified field of perception where everything was completely unified. Like a dance, like you can see the whole dance, or the big picture, you know, that people talk about. I want to see the big picture. And therefore, it would be easy to say, from that perspective, forgive them for they know not what they do. It's just like, don't put belief, don't put faith in these actions and these behaviors. God is still love. God hasn't changed. God is not changing, no matter what the appearances are. So, how beautiful that we have an opportunity, that that is our life's purpose, is to see the world in a different way, to see the way that Christ saw. And the beautiful thing about Jesus is, is that he really didn't try to beat people over the head with it, either. I mean, <clears throat> I've seen lots of portraits and pictures and paintings of Jesus, and the ones that that really stand out for me are the ones where he, he's standing there and he's got his arms out like open, outstretched. You know, come unto me. It's like he's not trying to grab anybody and twist their arm, arm behind their back. He's not forcing anybody to come. He's just got the arms outstretched and they're open. And they're, they're very welcoming. It's just like saying, come, come and rest. Rest in me. Rest in my love. So, that's really the invitation uh, that what seems to be time and what seems to be separation is just playing out like a movie. And we could say that this, we could call history a very long movie. <laughs> It's a very, very long movie. And so, the life of a human being is such a very tiny little blip in that movie. Uh, it's almost like if you, were, if you were flying in a plane over the whole movie, uh, you could easily miss your entire lifespan if you really weren't paying close attention. It would just kind of be like a little flicker. You know, like when you're flying in a plane and you're coming into Sweden or Malmo or Copenhagen and you're flying over the water and there's these little flickers of light that are reflecting from the sun and that's about what a human life is. It seems pretty long while you're living it but it actually is more like just a little flicker uh, that's, that's flickering on, on the water, just a, a reflection. And so what is the purpose of life? What is the purpose of that flicker? except to forgive, except to awaken to your true nature, your true reality, the way God created you. You know, that's, that's a vast purpose. And yet, how easy it is in this world to lose sight 
of the flicker, to lose sight of the purpose. Look at all the things that you can get distracted on, worried about, concerned about. Uh, things like money. Uh, you could see from the movie last night that these people were really concerned about the money. Uh, they had a budding relationship starting, but uh, most of their conversations were about television ratings, selling uh, trinkets, all <laughs> kinds of crazy <laughs> trinkets they were selling on those shows. But they were the, most of their time and their energy was focused on the selling of these trinkets, the ratings, getting higher ratings, getting eight percent increase. You know, is it is it selling things was life or death. And then, in the middle of that, they were trying to uh, fall in love, <laughs> which is not easy to do when your life is so distracted <laughs> on on trinkets. You know, you have to you have to begin to release your mind a bit from the trinkets to do that. And and you could see how the holy man was just symbolizing a state of of detachment, a state of uh, of non-judgment, of allowance. Uh, when they would come to him and and they would say to him, after they gained a bit of respect for him, at the beginning there was they were trying to just he was trying to get rid of him, you know, he <laughs> get him get him out of here, let him go on. I told you you shouldn't have waved. That whole grievance came up over and over about waving, waving, waving. You started this whole thing by waving to a stranger, and yet by the end they were saying. Uh, Ricky was saying to him, you know, what do you think? And and basically G was saying, what do you want? Mm -hmm. I'll do it. I'll do it for you. What do you want? You know, how beautiful. Mm -hmm. So much allowance. Yeah. Imagine that. Imagine the kind of relationships you'd have in this world if you were partnered up with someone or a group of people that you've just poured your heart out and you were asking for help and advice and instead of telling you what to do, they simply said, or your partner simply said, well, what do you want? They just focused you back onto what is the desire of your heart. You know, It was like G was saying to him, I love you. I love you. I totally, unconditionally love you. Now what do you want? I'll love you after your decision. <laughs> I loved you before your decision. You know, that's really a beautiful expression of love. When you have so much strength and confidence that you can just allow someone to make a decision and then love them right beyond whatever that decision is. And we do get a lot of practice. You know, we get practice, you know, growing up with, with children. We get practice with our friends, with our family, with our co-workers, with our boss, you know. and. It seems like we get lots of opportunities to get so in touch with what we want that we actually come to a state of mind where we realize that we are very powerful in God's, created in God's likeness and image, and what we want is what we get. We always get what we want. As you sow, so shall you reap. Giving and receiving are the same. What goes around comes around. The law of karma. I mean, it doesn't matter what culture, whether you read the Bible or the Bhagavad Gita or philosophy or whatever, there's a basic law of the universe which is that giving and receiving are the same. That's also why we have sayings like, be careful what you pray for. You just might get it. Oh, it's more than just might. <laughs> it is, you will get it. And if you will get it, if you pray, if you ask and you shall be given, if you knock and the door shall be opened, you really have to get clear on what you're asking for. Because if you're asking amiss, if you're really asking for something that we'll call egoic, or something that is, that is a private wish or desire, you will get it, and it won't be satisfying. And then you'll wish again, like a wishing well. <laughs> or like having Aladdin with the genie. How many, was it ten wishes? <laughs> you get more than ten. <laughs> In this universe you keep wishing 
and wishing and wishing, and you keep receiving and receiving until you you purge, until you purify your heart and get to the point where your asking is in alignment with the Spirit. And then you can become so in alignment with the Spirit that suddenly asking sounds absurd. Like, what if you had everything? <laughs> what would you ask for? <laughs> what if you had the Kingdom of Heaven in your hand, so to speak, you, you really knew what the Kingdom of Heaven was, then suddenly you wouldn't be asking uh, for things to be a certain way, you know, for things to be different. <clears throat> Imagine how funny that prayer sounds to God. Please, God, let things be different than they are. Uh, please, God, let... The, and, and yet, when we grow up, how much of our prayers, how many of our prayers are that prayer? You know? Can I, can I have more of this? Can I have more of that? Can I not go to this? Can I, you know, you know asking for circumstances to be different? Yes. Uh, you say that we all get what we want. Um, uh, I have a friend that would not uh, agree with you <laughs> because, uh, uh, and she's coming to our Course in Miracles group in North Shopping, and she has always, she, she is 45 years old now, she has always wanted a man, a husband, and a child, and she has not got it. And she's praying and she's praying, and, and, and we say that, we say to her that, leave it up to God. But you say that it, we get things even if it's uh, very private for us and even if it's our ego that wishes it. Uh, so how, what would you say to her? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, one, the one who's single and alone when yeah, she's ready to be... Yeah, a child and a husband. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's kind of like on the surface of form, we could say that whatever seems to be going on in specifics and forms is just the answer, or bringing us the answer to the prayer of our heart in a, in a specific form. Uh, so we, we never really ask in our hearts for things. We're really asking for an experience, for a state of mind. And if you have to talk more with her, you would have to say, well, what is your experience? If she said, well, I'm lonely. Uh, I want a ch why do I want a husband and a child is I want some something to fill my life up uh, I want a feeling of, of joining of connection I want to share my life with someone and I want to share the joys of being a parent and so on and so forth and but I'm lonely uh, and so if you really got her to get to the point of, of starting to admit uh, that there's a lack going on and it could take the form of loneliness, or feeling isolated, or feeling uh, empty, unfulfilled, you know, whatever words she would come up with. And you would talk with her and she would express her things, okay, feeling empty and a bit alone and, and a bit unfulfilled. Uh, okay, the world, the, the way your life looks is a reflection of those feelings. You're feeling empty, or isolated, or alone, and the way your life looks, they, it's not, the way that it looks isn't making you feel that way. You're feeling that way because of your consciousness, because of where you're at, and you're feeling that way because of your prayers. You have, if you're feeling lonely or empty or isolated, you're praying for loneliness, emptiness, and isolation, because you're always getting uh, what you're praying for. So the form is simply out picturing it's bringing witness to an inner state of mind. We always look inside first, and then we look outside, and we see out there what we saw in there. So that's how you would talk with her and approach it with her, and, and then you could start saying, you don't really want to be lonely, do you? <laughs> uh, you would start working more in cultivating the, f the experience within, the feelings, looking at the beliefs, looking at the thoughts that are running through the mind on a daily basis and say, good news is you're not a victim. You're not powerless based on those thoughts. You are not powerless based on those beliefs. You can change them. You can change them as quickly as you'd like. There's no time limit on it. You can change. And then, of course, 
demonstration is the best. Uh, uh, all of us have known people we've met who, we've met some very, very happy, joyful people. Some of them are what the world would call single, and some of them are what the world would call married. Some of them have children, some of them don't have children. Uh, happiness, joy, love, are they're not circumstance dependent. Uh, if, if they were circumstance dependent, then everyone would go for the same <laughs> thing. Well, you've got to be married and have children to be happy. Okay. Then it really puts the pressure on the dating game. <laughs> you know, if it was so. Or, you must be single and you must not have children to be happy. Some people have told me they believe that. <laughs> if only I was single and didn't have children, then I would have. But we see that it's not dependent on the circumstances. And people all know this, so I, you could talk to her about that. But she, she can recognize this. It's just like that feeling of, of being alone. Sometimes people could say, even when I'm in a crowd of people, I feel alone. And sometimes when they're a walk, on a walk in the forest, and they're all by themselves, they feel such joy and connection, like they feel connected to the whole universe and everyone. So it's the same with the feeling of, of connectedness versus aloneness. You know, it's not really circumstance dependent, even though the ego or the error would teach us that, oh yes, you are feeling the way you are because of some uh, circumstance. So it's very practical. You can have a good heart-to-heart -heart talk with her. So it comes down to your core belief about yourself. Yeah, your core belief. Not your kind of vicious. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I had students back in the 1990s, and I would just go every day. We'd have these sessions, and be so happy. And some of them would say, "David, you know, yes, yes, yes. We see you're very happy, but, but your circumstances, you know." I said, if you were married, and if you had children, and if you had a mortgage, and if you had a boss like I've got, and this and this and this, let's just see how happy you would be. And I'd say, well, it would be really strange that God would set up a world where some people could have fortunate circumstances, and other people could have unfortunate circumstances, you know. Wouldn't it be much more reasonable to think that, that whatever world you're perceiving is there by your own selection, that you've selected uh, your life as you know it. You've, you've built it. It's like a little child with the building blocks, you know, making a castle, making a little fort or something, you know, building it, and then looking at what has been built. And it's like, there's really no point in lamenting uh, circumstances, because they're there by decision. They've been chosen. And of course, you can choose again. Uh, you know, it's not like you're locked in uh, to those circumstances. You can even choose to seem to change those circumstances. Although I would say that that's not even a real change. It's like I always say, like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Uh, you know, the ship is going down. If you've seen the movie <laughs> yeah. Titanic, uh, the engineer who built the ship uh, knew exactly. Uh, how many compartments were in it, and ask very calmly, ask questions when it is at the big party under, underneath in the deck. Uh, the ship's been hit, uh, we've hit an iceberg, it's taking on water. How many compartments uh, of the ship are filled up? They told him how many. It's, we're sunk. <laughs> he, knew, he knew his engineering, he knew, he didn't have to wait for time. Uh, he said, we're sunk, you know, the ship will sink. There's no doubt about it, because so many compartments had already filled up with water, and he knew exactly how many it would take to sink the ship. And it's the same way. It's like you don't, you don't really have to try to figure out the world. How am I going to get out of this situation? And then when I get out of that, then I've got to deal with this one, and then if I escape this one, then I'll have to face that one. You know, it, it can get pretty depressing to think, how am I going to unwind myself out of these circumstances that I've put myself into? But then, if you say, no, I don't, I don't really have to figure it out. Uh, in one sense, you know, the, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, are saying, oh, this world was over long ago, he says. 
So you don't have to be concerned about how to revive it or revive your life. It's history. Your whole life, even if you think it's ahead of you, <laughs> it's all history. It's all over and gone. And it's been gone for a long time. The Holy Spirit healed this thing long ago. Then he comes in with the section on the real alternative, and he says, all of the roadways of the world lead to death. It doesn't sound very pos positive, actually. <laughs> All of the roadways of the world lead to death. You can choose, you can continue to choose, and choose as many as you would like, but he said, I'm just giving them to you straight. They all lead to death. So there is another way. To, the kingdom of heaven is within, and there is an al a real alternative. It's not really a, a <coughs> dark, pessimistic thing, because you have an alternative that's always there waiting for you. But it is helpful to know that no matter how much you try to improve the circumstances of your life, that in the end it's more of a surrendering, it's more of a yielding over, like, oh, thank God I was wrong about this. Take this from me. Take the whole thing. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to try to prop it up or fix it up or improve it anymore. Please take the whole thing and then let me receive your grace, you know, as, as a certain replacement for this thing that I seem to make. That's a very relieving, comforting idea, because then you don't really have to, to go about the task of trying to work out your salvation, or figure out how to extract yourself from a certain set of circumstances. You actually just have to be willing to be guided and led moment by moment, in sure confidence that the guide within you knows the way, and all you have to do is listen and follow and you will be led surely uh, back to a state of peace. And that's wonderful. You know, you can just say, thank God <laughs> that it's, it's that way. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> Instead of, of being concerned about the, the question, what should I do, it does help you cultivate and go deeper and deeper inward. So instead of really asking yourself, what shall I do, you can you could say, what what is it that I want? I mean, really go back much deeper, you know, like Shakespeare said, to be or not to be, you know, that is the question. It wasn't about doing this or doing that. It, there was no pressure put on, you know, what do I have to do? You know, it's very heavy. No one likes to feel like they have to do something. But to start in a realistic way, to go inward and say, what do I want? What do I really want? First, you start to acknowledge the power of your wanting. Uh, instead of feeling like a victim of the world, oh, this is my life story, and this this happened to me when I was seven, and this happened to me when I was twelve, and as if you're just a victim of of circumstances, you know that's not true. Uh, and if everything that you experience is there through what you want, you know it couldn't even seem to be in your experience unless you wanted it then the first thing to do is to acknowledge the power of your wanting. Instead of playing little, <laughs> instead of playing weak, you know, it's it's important to say, hmm, okay, I got a, must have a pretty powerful mind going on here, and and these thoughts that I've just called chitter-chatter, uh, oh, this uh, crazy static that's in my mind, and I'm just trying to go away, get away. You know, I, I better first acknowledge that even with this chatter, uh, that I have a very powerful mind, so whatever is chattering, that little chatterbox in there, I better investigate uh, what's going on with this chatterbox, because <laughs> if I have a powerful mind, there will I will experience. I am not alone in experiencing the effects of my thoughts. 
is the way Jesus puts it in the Course in Miracles. And then, once you start to acknowledge the power of your wanting, the power of your prayer, then you can start to go deeper inward with, hmm, what is it really that I, that I want? What is my priority here? And I would say, as you go deeper inward with that, you start to realize that, that really you want to use the power of your wanting and direct it towards peace of mind. I mean, what trinkets of the world could you possibly want if you had the option of choosing peace of mind, uh, everlasting peace? I mean, what, what, I mean, I had a guy in Florida one time that says, you know, if I, want, if I open my mind to God, can I still have my Maserati? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> it's like what, you just have to really get clear of what what, you, what matters most <laughs> to you, what you really, really want, and and then once you get into the power of your wanting, then then you start to discern, you know, to use your discernment, your discrimination, and and I think everyone, of course, has funneled more to, more and more to that place of seeing that oh. I want a state of mind. I really want the peace of God. In the workbook uh, of A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, I want the peace of God. To say the words is nothing. But to mean the words is everything. So that's where you really have to be in touch with what you want. Because there's no spiritual cliches or phrases that magically you just you know say the words and ah it is there or like uh, Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz you know she, they told her all you had to do is click your heels together little red ruby slippers three times one two three and say the words there's no place like home there's no place like home to go home uh, in one sense the, Glenda, the good witch, is telling, it's the Holy Spirit speaking, and saying, you always had the power to go home. And that's true. It's just that, that it's beyond a, a catchphrase, or knowing the right mantra, or saying the right words in just the right way, or something like that. Like one of those um, old stories about witches, abracadabra, and you got to say just the right words to uh, have it unlock the spell. This is really saying that you have to go in your heart and you really have to be sincere about this wanting. What is it that I really, really want? And then all things open up from, from that. You don't need intelligence. You don't need lots of money. You don't need lots of skills and abilities, uh, all the things the world would say are are essential. But you do need willingness. You just need willingness. And a willingness goes a long way. I know in my life, <laughs> I didn't have a lot of money. I didn't think I had a lot of skills or, or anything, but, but I was just, I know I was very, very willing to be shown, you know, to, to let the doors be opened. Show me the way. With, with real honesty and sincerity, you know. and wow, <laughs> if you come to God with willingness and sincerity, then watch out. <laughs> I would say it'll knock your socks off, really. <laughs> uh, David, yes. when this willingness is little, and, uh, and you do not know so much, how can you? Increase willing. How can you find? Uh, I mean, you can have a little willingness, and you are very attracted by ideas uh, of the course, for example. So you can start, and then you stop maybe. So the willingness is not there really. So how can we work for for ourselves and even for others to increase willingness? Well, it's it's just like. <clears throat> something of this world, if you were going to learn it, if you were learning anything in this world, you, you practice it. And and it's the same with willingness, It's or it's like with 
with uh, the muscles, you when you exercise muscles and you exercise and you exercise, then you seem to be developing a strength uh, <coughs> over time by through the practice or through the exercise. And it's very much that way with willingness that that you you have a little willingness and then it seems like you're called upon again and again and again in circumstance, in opportunity after opportunity, you know, to have this willingness. You know, he says in the Course, you know, my brother, choose again, uh, no matter what the circumstance, no matter how many times it seems to repeat, or no matter how challenging it can seem to be, my brother, choose again, choose again. Um, so it's it's a little different than than the things of this world. I mean, we're used to to a, to practicing. We're used to doing things like exercise or uh, reading something over and over uh, to memorize it for an exam or something like this. But uh, we just we weren't raised with this idea of of opening to guidance from God and practicing this little willingness over and over. Uh, we, through the ego, generated a world of, of seeming authority figures from teachers and parents and so-called experts that tell us what to do and very much have been in the role of blindly just following. You know, oh, I was told what to do, so I must do it. Instead of questioning and saying, well, why? <laughs> you know, like that story of the the little child, the emperor has no clothes on. The emperor has no clothes. Everybody can see that the emperor has no clothes, and everybody goes along with this charade and never acknowledges that the emperor has no clothes until the little child comes along and goes, hey, he's not wearing any clothes. Uh, there's a certain sincerity <clears throat> to be able to just Let's call a spade a spade. Let's call it like it is, and not just blindly heed and follow uh, those that are supposed to be in charge. We certainly have. A lot of us have gone through that with religion. You know, where we've, you know, we've just listened to figures. You know, priests and ministers, and and it could be a pope. It could be, you know, some a rabbi, some kind of figure that that is supposed to know. The religion and know God, and we feel like we don't know God, so we better follow somebody who does. And then there's, of course, a lot of disillusionment with that, because a lot of times we uncover all kinds of hypocrisies and and things that don't seem to be have integrity or have congruity. Uh, we follow the flesh, and then we get the results of <laughs> following the flesh, and yet. The, the willingness, I think what, what I would say is like with A Course in Miracles, if you're willing for miracles, then you start to experience them. And they feel good. They feel very good. And so, when you have that experience of, of being willing to listen and follow, and then you have a very joyful, wonderful experience, something inside you goes, hmm, interesting. Maybe I should try that again. And so you do. And that's why it seems to be a course in miracles. Uh, it, just like with learning in this world, you have to have successes to build your confidence. Just like a child, you know, if a child always was falling off a bike when they were trying to learn to pedal the bike, it would, it would be very discouraging and very depressing and they may just say, that's it. I don't want to ride a bike if they just had experiences of falling off the bike. But as soon as they have that experience of actually pedaling the bike and feeling a sense of balance and equilibrium and then hearing usually their friend or their parent are going, you're doing it, you're doing it, <laughs> you can do it, you know, they still may fall off. Like in the movie, As It Is In Heaven, Daniel, <laughs> he falls off, but Lena, you know, comes back with him, and she's encouraging, and how far, you know, it's, he has to have success at riding that bike before he's willing to go further with it. So 
So that's how miracles work, and that's how willingness works, is you, you increase the willingness by your practice of it, and then the more successes you have, the more you gain confidence in it. And you need that confidence because what the miracle is showing you is going opposite of everything you've ever learned in this world. And that's why miracles have to be heavily reinforced, because the old way of perceiving, the separation way, was heavily reinforced. So you need to kind of turn the tide. And it works. <laughs> Jesus does even, all of his talk about little willingness, he does say near the end of the book, you know, it takes great willingness to see that all events and outcomes and circumstances are helpful. <laughs> That's another version of all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. Or all things work together for good. There are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. That's the mind training that we're working on. You can imagine just being in that state where it's like la 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 la. No matter what's happening, earthquakes, typhoons, tornadoes, all things work together for good. <laughs> you know, it's it's not really. I mean, people will say, David, that's oh, it's so Pollyanna. You know, it's like, oh, Pollyanna, she just saw the good, saw the positive. <laughs> it's kind of got a negative, pejorative context in this world, but it's actually beautiful, you know, to be in that state. What would you say about Burma? And what is that? The earthquake in China, all things work together for good. Yeah, they do, all things. I was just talking with some friends about that because I was visiting in, um, in Berlin and uh, they were saying, hmm, interesting things going on with China with the Dalai Lama and all this conflict around Tibet mm -hmm. and then uh, the Olympics coming and all the controversies and peace marches in support of Tibet and <coughs> saying they were going to communicate with the Dalai Lama, with the with his envoy, but then, you know, how much of it is just for show versus actual heartfelt, you know, communication. And then lots of things going on, like uh, during the winter, you know, intense snowstorms and people, trains and transportation systems shut down. And it's been quite a series of events that have been going on. and. You know, in one way, what's going on with China is just paralleling what goes on with everyone, every individual, that that we really need to open our communication channels up uh, in honesty and sincerity. And when we don't, when our heart is closed, uh, then it seems like there's all these obstacles and blocks in the world. But they really aren't in the world. It's kind of what's going on with China is kind of a symbol about how it's so important to open up uh, to guidance and to be guided and to flow with that guidance as opposed to, you know, staying with the hard line or staying with uh, the old ways. Um, every, it really comes down to, to mind or consciousness, you know, even when uh, you see pictures or, or stories of, uh, of monks that are kind of becoming more proactive for, like, freedom fighters, <laughs> you know. Uh, they, they, again, for the monks, you have to go back to, okay, what's my purpose? Uh, am I to find peace of mind, or am I to try to free a country? Uh, this is the same thing Gandhi went through, you know. He kept trying to free India uh, from the British, and the deeper he went, the more, you know, one guy said, Mr. Gandhi, you know, are you uh, a, a saint trying to become a politician? And Gandhi answered, no, it's the opposite. <laughs> I'm a politician <laughs> trying to become a saint. <laughs> you know, Gandhi was well aware <laughs> that, that as much as he was going for a political solution, that he grew up in India, the tradition of the great saints and mystics, and Gandhi hated to be called Mahatma uh, because it was, you know, great soul. 
and he, in the context of, of Ramana Maharshi and Yogananda and many great, great Vivekananda and Krishna and the whole tradition of coming to enlightenment, self-realization, you know, he was like, no, I'm a politician trying to become a saint. I don't care how famous you say I am. I don't care how many people you say follow me and this and that. I'm experimenting with truth. I'm trying to work on my own soul here and trying to purify it. And it doesn't help when you call me Mahatma. Mm. It's just feeding my ego. So stop it. <laughs> no. Mm. So, so you see, it puts everything in a context of how you re it's really valuable to go for that transformation of consciousness where you are seeking not to change the world, not to free a country or to free a, a group of people even, but actually going for a state of mind that is free, that has forever been free. And and, and that's a huge leap in consciousness. I mean, I've, I did a, a gathering, I think, in, in New York City one time, and this woman came uh, who has spent her whole life as, as a child advocate and a social worker and uh, striving to make people's lives better, uh, to leave the world a better place. And she spent a whole afternoon with me at a gathering and uh, just had her pad and pencil and just with all her openness and sincerity, she was just like almost squinting <laughs> to try to open up to some of these ideas. At the end she came up to me and she just said, oh, I feel you, all the love pouring from you and I feel such such sincerity and such wisdom and happiness, she said, but the ideas you're sharing are just contradicting so many things that I believe in but my whole life, my whole, my job, my, all the effort and energy. I met a woman, I did a talk in Geneva, and um, I met a woman who was the head of UNICEF in uh, in, in all the Middle East, I think it was, uh, she'd been uh, based in uh, Iran. And so she'd been working with UNICEF her whole life, was dedicated decades to, you know, helping children and, and feeding the poor and so on and so forth. And uh, she came and listened to me there in uh, Geneva and she came up afterwards and she just was smiling. She said, oh, I'm so, I just I'm so glad I got to hear these ideas that, oh, it's so exciting, but, but wow, <laughs> it really it was like, it was a stretch, it was a stretch, you know, to come from such a, a passion and a desire to help, to be altruistic and truly helpful, and then to start to come into some of the deeper ideas of the most helpful thing you can do is to free your mind from ego thinking and from trying to fix and change the world. And so it's a progression. Uh, I certainly went through the very stages myself from uh, starting off in, oh David, you're very good in science and math and you would excel in taking all the aptitude tests in high school and then going to this program in high school called Engineer for a Day and they took me to, they took me to the plant where most uh, of the uh, the propulsion, the jet engines, those big things that are hanging on the plane, are built. General Electric in Cincinnati, uh, not too far from my peace house, builds these massive turbine <laughs> engines and they stick on the planes all around the world. And uh, so I went there and kind of toured and, oh, you're very good in math mathematics and calculus and science and everything. So I, I started off in the university in engineering. Uh, something wasn't right, just wasn't my calling, so then I got into more of the urban planning and, you know, and then I got more interested in causes and and making the world, the, the planet a better place, and so I got involved in activism. That's a progression, you know. You, if you watch, everyone goes through these progressions where you, you want to be helpful, you become less egocentric and less self-centered on the personality self and you want to help and then you kind of swing over maybe towards more towards service or helping others in some way and and many people burn out 
with that along the way because it's even that it's they feel so tired they feel drained uh, working with clients and and it's almost like they're trying to there's a dam and the dam is breaking loose and the water is squirting out and they're taking little rocks and little clumps of clay every day and try to plug as many holes in the dam as they can and they come home exhausted they're just totally exhausted they're just plugging the holes every day you know and feeling like like almost like a martyr, you know, like I'm sacrificing my life here to make the world a better place and it's it's too big of a job. Mm -hmm. And then progressively you go deeper into spirituality and you get to a point where you start to realize, hmm, the reason it is so draining is because it's an inside job that you can't fix all of the problems of the world on all those different levels from communal levels and interpersonal levels and and psychic conflicts and conflicts between nations. You know, if you put all your energy into trying to solve the world in that way, you will become drained because you're you're looking for a solution where there is no solution. You know, you you can't just keep trying to plug the dam. You know, you have to get back to where all that pressure, that water pressure is coming from. You've got to go back into the mind, into the consciousness. There are many examples of people. I remember when I first got into A Course in Miracles, I started watching these videotapes of people who are working with A Course in Miracles. The speech writer for the President of the United States studies A Course in Miracles? I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I'm listening to Milton Friedman and it's like, he's like going, he said on the video, before we can have peace, between nations, this is the speechwriter for the president talk, talking, we need to come to inner peace. We need to learn to forgive in our own awareness, in our own consciousness, before we can have peace in the world. Oh, then I saw another guy who was a Pentagon general, Pentagon general, former Pentagon general, who who got out of, you know, he progressed, he got out of being the general thing and, and he started working for uh, the Library of Congress and United Nations and it's, he, he left his whole general role behind and he became an advocate for uh, communications, better communications between nations. He was a representative to China and um, he worked for United Nations Library of Congress and this and this. Oh, he got into A Course in Miracles. We have this former Pentagon general now who's working for the United Nations, and he says on the video, <clears throat> I opened the book up, and a passage that really struck me, because I had spent my whole life trying to change the world, was, seek not to change the world. <laughs> seek rather to change your mind about the world. This is like a Pentagon general and, and somebody who's in the United Nations reading, getting hit with one line from Jesus. And what did he do? He married Judy Scutch, the publisher of A Course in Miracles, and he spent the last decades translating A Course in Miracles into all these different languages. He's the one who was in charge of getting it translated into Swed Swedish. So the book, if you're reading the book in Swedish, there's a, a ex-Pentagon general from the United States <laughs> that was involved in you reading that book in Swedish. Because he married the, the publisher and he spent, he's very devoted, his name is William Whitson, and he spent, you know, the last decades, starting off in the 70s and now we're in 2008, like a steward, stewarding this book along. And 